Good morning. I can actually start this morning with the legitimate smile on my face because for the first time in months, I've got a good news story. Yesterday with Margaret Mitchell, the MP, you met the Polish woman, Kate Wawaska, and her little, she's Polish, and her little boy, Matthew, who is eight months old. The funny thing was that the little boy was born three weeks after she landed in Canada on a visitor's visa. That makes him a Canadian citizen who cannot be deported. She wanted and wants to stay here so that her husband, who is in some kind of trouble in Poland, can join them under family reunification. I'm happy to tell you that the Immigration Department has come round to look at it on a humanitarian basis and that uh, she will be allowed to go to Seattle with the consent of the American authorities, that had been a snag, and arrangements have been made for a minister's permit to be issued when she comes back to the border with the little baby Matthew, her other son, Ania, and she'll be allowed to stay in Canada. And I want to say thanks to all of the Webster audience who have helped out yesterday with, with offers of accommodation and with money. So all is okay for little Matthew Wovaska, his sister and his mother. Now, Monroe was to be here this morning. Monroe has been well out of the way of any trouble while the crisis has been building on Lyle Island, working on some royal commission on unemployment insurance in the far reaches of the other parts of Canada. But he's stuck in the snow. He's going to try and get it here, get here sometime before the program ends this morning to see what he thinks about the mess on Lyle Island. Fortunately, I have here a man wearing a beaver hat. <laughs> Look at them. Talk about showbiz. Who does he think he is? He is, in fact, of course, Peter Newman. And he's going to make a, another fortune with an excellent book. Uh, about a pugnacious relic of empire, the, the longest lived continuous capitalist corporation probably in the world, the Hudson's Bay. The man is Peter Newman, and we're going to talk to Peter about his latest success in publishing. Number two on the hit parade already. Don't you hate these successful people? <laughs> and then, for all those frustrated women in my audience who are looking for a rich husband, and most of you probably are if you're free, I have a fellow with an incredible name called Thomas Schnurmacher. It means lace maker. I'm told he's the dean of Canadian gossip, and he writes the book on the gold digger's guide, How to Marry Rich. What else have I got this morning? Is that it? Back with Peter Newman after the break. The Company of Adventurers. Peter Newman, let's first of all show me your hat. Well, this is the Weaver hat. This is what it was all about. It is not, as many people think, a kind of a Davy Crockett hat. It's, uh, it's the inside of the fur. It's the felt, the underfur. And uh, it uh, told people exactly what you were. If you look at this uh, page in my book, you can see that uh, somebody's status was uh, explained by a kind of hat he had, a kind of decorations. This was a naval admiral, this was an army officer, this was a businessman, etc. What was this one? Uh, that was a, called a regent. A regent? A very successful businessman. Oh, uh, he was a very successful businessman who belonged to the Bay or just was a successful businessman? No, just a successful businessman. In Montreal? Uh, no, in, in England. Uh, in England? In, all over Europe they wore this. For 200 years, this was how people differentiated themselves from one another. And it wasn't only the kind of hat you wear, it was how you wore it, how you parked it, how you took it off, how you put it on. Hopefully. If you were a drunken lecher, you wore it very jaunty <laughs> on the side, didn't you? That's eh? right. That's right. Side. If you were a square Presbyterian, you wore it on the top. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, I probably looked like Eugene Will and perished the thought. <laughs> Doesn't quite fit you. I didn't know they had purple beavers. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they dyed them. They dyed them. And oh, they, also, they also went crazy making them. Uh, you know, the saying, mad as a, what is it, mad as a hatter? 
Yeah, it matters a hat. That, that's uh, because the people who made these hats swallowed a lot of lead and mercury, and they went crazy. Do me a favor, wear the hat. You look better <laughs> with it on than with your bald pate. <laughs> Thank you. As a matter of fact, you look, quite, you look like a drunken lecturer wearing that hat. All right, I'll put it this way. <laughs> okay, let's start at the beginning. The Hudson Bay Company. Why the Hudson Bay Company? Did they, did, who gave you a half a million dollars in advance to write this book? Penguin, uh, the uh, British publishing house. Uh, the reason I wrote it is that... Uh, Did you say yes to my question? Yes. <laughs> Half a million dollars for some well, no, stuff? No, no, not for this book, for, for the whole series. There are going to be three books. For some stuff filched out of the archives and put together <laughs> with your normal skill and erudition? Well, it wasn't quite that. I, I did 120 interviews just for this one volume. Oh, I know you did. Work. But half a million dollars? Yeah. Well, listen, that's good. A Canadian author should be paid. This is an international book. It's, it's all over the world. Listen, I'm proud of you. How many books? Uh, well, there's 100,000 uh, printed in the first printing. Uh, just today, they're going on the press for a second run. And this is the first of three books? Yes. First of three books, is it? Yes. And then uh, movie rights, of course? <laughs> no, it's a miniseries, television miniseries. Eight CBC? hours. CBC? Uh, CBC, BBC, and Walt Disney. Uh-huh. Fantastic. All right. I want to know about the people on whose backs the Hudson Bay was built with the gross capitalist uh, tactics. Well, they, they were all Scotsmen. Uh, they were paid six pounds a year, ten dollars a year. Uh, most of them came from the Orkneys. Seventy-six percent of the Hudson Bay servants were from the Orkneys. And of course, they came to Hudson Bay to get warm. It was warmer in Hudson Bay than it was uh, in the Orkneys and Shetlands. I know I've been in the Orkneys, yeah. I can believe that. You know what it's like. But were the Arcadians merely servants and, and uh, trappers and traders? They, they never got into positions of prominence, the Arcadians, did they? That's right. There were four exceptions. Only four people out of uh, 150 years of Arcadians coming over here ever made the officer class. Um, the, the, the Scotsmen, the Highlanders and the Orcadians married Indians, or country married. It wasn't real marriage. And, uh, you mean they took advantage of the native women? Uh, well, for which, and you have been accused of a sexist, racist uh, attitude in your book. That's right. And uh, you know, people who say that are crazy because you can't judge what happened uh, 300 years ago on the forlorn shores of Hudson Bay by today's standards. And anyway, it wasn't just a sexual thing. Uh, the the women were used as interpreters. They were mentors in the fur trade because these boys uh, had never seen anything outside their homes in Presbyterian Scotland. They weren't allowed to play cards on Sunday, and suddenly they were in this new world with, with women who, who were available. And, and the Indians wanted them available because the Indians wanted a better deal when they came into trade. And Indian society works along kinship lines, so they wanted Indian women in the white man's house and bed because they got a better deal when they came into trade. That's a good practical proposition, in other words. That's right. It wasn't a question of love at first sight, though, was it? No, but the, the intermarriage was incredible. I, one story about the Marquis of Lorne, who was the Governor General of Canada in 1881. He came to a place called Rat Portage, and he said, uh, you know, I've never met a real Indian to the Hudson Bay Factor. And the Hudson Bay Factor motioned the fiercest looking brave over to meet them, and he, he said, w would you come here for a minute, MacDonald? <laughs> <laughs> that was his name, of course. <laughs> Donald MacDonald, no <laughs> doubt, I can right. tell you that too. But more seriously, what made it such a, a success over the years? The demand for furs. The demand for furs for these hats. There were six million Canadian beavers gave their lives for these hats. Um, the reason the company survived were three. First of all, it was very adaptable. You know, when the fur, when these hats went out of fashion, uh, then they got into water transport. When that, when the trains came, then they got into selling land. When that was. Uh, all the land was sold, and they got into department stores to service the people who settled on the land. So it was like a Darwinian evolution. They always moved to something new. Secondly, they diversified. They didn't just sell furs. It's hard not to think of the bay. It, it was very hard. Uh, the, the bay owned uh, the whole country. Now, not the whole country. Well, it, it owned uh, one-twelfth of the Earth's surface. Uh, the original land grant was ten times the size of the Holy Roman Empire at its height. It's an incredible amount of land. And uh, who got this grant? Who was the guy who fiddled the grant from the Brits? It, well, no, it was Prince Rupert who fiddled the grant from Charles II, the King of England, and then it was sold to Canada in 1870 and became the four western provinces. Oh. That's, that's what it was all about. In other words, we've got to separate the gentlemen adventurers trading into the Hudson Bay from the bay itself, have we? That's right, uh, because the, the Hudson Bay was just at the beginning when they settled around Hudson Bay and they let the Indians do all the work. The Indians killed the animals, skinned them, brought them out to Hudson Bay. 
Uh, but after that, the company moved inland and settled the whole west. Now, you tell me that they were given the grant, was that Rupert's land? That's right. That was Rupert's land. Of the whole four western provinces? Virtually. Yeah, it was about 45% uh, of, the, of the Canadian territory. And did that have to be purchased back from the bay? It was purchased back from the bay for 300,000 pounds and a land grant. And that land grant gave the Hudson's Bay Company all the mineral and oil rights over the west. And that's where their real wealth came from. And they still have some of and the land still grants. Have, that's right. Was there much corruption involved? You know, when one, when one talks to the CPI and John McDonald and Graft and nepotism and whatnot, is the Bay similarly scarred by that kind of political um, malingering? Well, they were very careful. Uh, you know, the East India Company bribed MPs, and the East India went, Company went out of business. Uh, the Hudson Bay Company was always very careful. They bribed people. Uh, they didn't buy politicians. They rented them, which was much easier to do in those days. Uh, in terms of corruption, uh, they weren't very corrupt, uh, but they were very uh, um, tough, very hard. You know, Pierre Radisson of Radisson Grossier, who really invented the whole idea that you could get furs by going into Hudson Bay instead of up to St. Lawrence. When he was in England in 1710 and he was down on his luck, they cut his pension. They wouldn't give him a job as an assistant warehouse keeper in London. And in the end, he died and they, they paid six pounds for his funeral. And it's mm -hmm. a very tough company. More with the man in the beaver hat. That's a topper, isn't it? That's a regent. A regent. A regent topper. It's yes. a topper. Yeah. After the <laughs> break. <laughs> Tell me, Peter Newman, Canada's most... Oh, if you want a phone, phone now. <laughs> if... Tell me, Peter Newman, uh, Canada's most successful author, how did they treat the Indians? The Bay. Well, the Bay had a, had a motto, don't shoot your customers. Uh, and the Indians were their customers. Uh, so they treated them fairly well. And it was a kind of a mutual exploitation. Uh, the Indians had li been living in the Stone Age. They wanted to move to the Iron Age. They wanted axes and rifles and hammers and all that stuff. And uh, they found that they could get them for furs, for which they had no use. So they thought they were ripping off the white men. The white men, of course, wanted the furs and made a lot of profit on it. So it was a kind of a mutual exploitation. There's a story going around the north, which is still there, and it's been there for 300 years, that if you wanted a gun from the Hudson's Bay Company, you had to pile up your furs, the height of the, of the, of the muzzle, and that the Hudson Bay Company kept uh, making rifles with longer and longer muzzles. Uh, it may have happened, but it didn't happen too much because the Indians were too smart. They knew they could get a rifle for 12 pelts, and they didn't need to trade in for 60. But the, the important thing is that the difference between the American frontier and the Canadian frontier mm -hmm was mainly the Hudson's Bay Company. You know, we had that corporate infrastructure, whereas the Americans, um, they had a very different kind of frontier. They had the vigilante mentality and the posse and the sheriff. People were challenging authority. In Canada, we were all company towns. The whole country was staffed by these fur trading posts, which are company towns. They were owned by the company, run by the company. When you live in a company town, you defer to authority. And they got as far down south as Vancouver, Washington, did they not? Oh, yes, so they, they owned all of Oregon. Uh, they, they, they had posts in San Francisco and Hawaii, Canton. But this business of deference is really important. You, know, you defer to authority, and too many of us Canadians still do that. And we, we always emphasize collective survival instead of individual excellence. And I think that's the difference between Americans and Canadians, and it's time we stop. Well, no, I think ours is a more civilized country in that we didn't suffer from the vigilante society. And we do normally, with certain notable exceptions, obey the rule of law. Well, that's right. That's, that's the good side of it. But the bad side of it is that we don't take risks. You know, we never go out and do something interesting or imaginative because we're scared of authority. Whether it's a, a British company or an American head office, it's the same kind of thing. Now, what about the state of the bay itself, though? It must have made untold millions in money over the years. Oh, yes. Now, the bay is one of the great investments and has been, has been the, the mainstay of empire. I mean, Sir Winston Churchill, when he left politics, he was offered hundreds of uh, corporate directorships. The only one he took was the Hudson's Bay Company because he knew how important it was to, to the British Empire. Now, tell me more about the actual start of the Bay itself after they got the grant. Well, was it an invasion of traders or gradually built up over the years? And did they rip all the wildlife off the land, leaving us with uh, a few remnants today? Well, the Hudson's Bay Company started in 1670. Prince Rupert, who was an incredible guy, he invented the torpedo, the uh, the pistol, the uh, bulletproof glass. He was a great artist. He was a real Renaissance man. But he's mainly now known for being the father of the Bay Company. He got the land grant from his cousin, Charles II. And the land grant, nobody knew how much land there was because nobody had been out here. 
but basically it was all the, all the land that was drained into Hudson Bay. And only 10% of Canada drains into the St. Lawrence, 45% into Hudson Bay. That's why the land grant was so large. And that it started in a very small way. I keep thinking about the guys in the canoes. No, no, that's right. It started, uh, they sat around the bay, uh, around the frozen sea for 125 years. They never moved. Uh, they just sat there and the Indians brought the furs in. And uh, it was only when the Montreal traders started to come up, the Northwest Company, ah, that yes. they moved inland. And then there was that great feud. What great feuds? Between the Northwesters and the Hudson's Bay Company, which was won by the Bay in 1821 when they took over the Northwest Company. I mean, it was a financial takeover just as of today. Well, it was a little worse. Uh, there, were, there were wars, there were ambushes, there were all kinds of people killed, uh, so it was even worse than uh, today's takeovers. All right, now what's your favorite incident in the book in relation to individuals? Uh, the Arcadians, the Orkney men you have covered, they were the servants, yeah. right? The Highlanders were the bosses in the various places. Well, my favorite incident, which is not in the book, uh, has to do with going up north. You know, I loved going up north to research this book. I went all around Hudson Bay. I went through the Eastern Arctic, Baffin Island, came to a place called Cape Dorset. And that's where most of the Eskimo art comes from. And I went into the workshop, and the man called John Houston had started it. And Houston told me this wonderful story of going in there, and the Eskimos were standing around in deputation and this was some time ago, and they asked him, you know, why is it that when we make these prints, uh, we get free supplies from the bay? Because they didn't understand uh, how it all worked. And he said, well, it's really very simple. These prints are sent to stores in southern Canada, and people come into the stores, they put money on the counter, and he showed them a dollar bill, and the store sends the money to the Hudson Bay Company, and you get your free supplies. Well, that was fine, but next day when Houston came into the workshop, all the Eskimos, instead of prints, were making dollar bills. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my favorite story, I haven't read all of the book yet, is what was found at the top of the spruce tree. Oh, yeah. Well, that's, a, that's I was trying to show how old the company is. And this man called Ed Bovey, who was born in Victoria, now is a big uh, Canadian establishment uh, figure in Toronto. And I told him I was doing this book, and he said, well, you know, when I was a young prospector, I was north of Lac Laurent in Saskatchewan with another guy. And we were just prospecting, and we sat down uh, to have dinner, cooked dinner. And suddenly, uh, the setting sun, we saw a glint of something way up in a spruce tree, 60 feet up. So we climbed up and got this thing down. It turned out to be a frying pan with the letters HBC stamped on it. Looked copper. At, copper, that's right, or what was left of it. So we sat around looking at this thing, wondering how in heaven's name did it get that far up a tree? And then we both burst out laughing because we realized that our own, cop our own copper kettle that we had used to cook dinner, we had hung on a little sapling. And that's what must have happened many, many years ago. They hung the HBC frying pan on a sapling, and Ed Bovey comes back maybe 100, 200 years later, and it's grown. And the, there's this big tree, and the thing is way up there. Well, you haven't said anything bad about the bay. This isn't a PR book. Oh, God, no, no. It's, oh, yes. Is the, has the bay got anything to do with the no, book? No, no, not at all. Uh, they have nothing to do financially, nothing to do editorially. Well, there's lots too bad to be said about the bay because they were so damn unimaginative. You know, they did not explore the country. They did not discover the Northwest Passage as they were supposed to do. Uh, but in the end, I think the influence was good because we did not have those Indian wars. You know, the Americans had 69 Indian wars, and it was virtual genocide. In our frontier, the Indians were not killed for that simple reason, because you don't shoot the customer. Did the factors act as policemen there, too? Yeah, the factors acted more like ship's captains. You know, it was like a, like a ship, because the little posts were the ships and the wilderness was the sea. And they had total authority in those posts. They could uh, marry a person, they could kill a person, they could do anything they wanted. And you they mean did. they could execute somebody for murder? Oh, yes, and they did. And they did? Oh, yes, yes. And that's still true. Uh, there are 120 Hudson Bay posts in the Canadian North, and they virtually rule those posts uh, like ship's captains or like kings. But they've got the criminal code to keep them from punishing people as such. Well, in theory, yeah. But you know, one of the things they do, for example, when uh, people get an old age pension check or a birth allowance, or, uh, they, they don't cash it. You get that much credit in the bay. They don't get the cash? No. You can only put it on your tab? That's right. That should be stopped. I agree. The other thing they do, which uh, really uh, makes me very angry, is they get the Indians and Eskimos hooked on uh, cigarettes and uh, Coca-Cola and candy, because that's where the biggest markup is. You say ban, or you're going to be paternalistic and say don't let them sell cigarettes. Who are uh, you to decide no, whether no, I'm, I'm, an Eskimo will drink Coca-Cola or smoke well, cigarettes? I don't, think it's, I don't think it's a good way for them to spend their money. You're exhibiting a typical <laughs> Canadian attitude that the establishment knows best. No, I don't. Mind you, you are the epitome <laughs> of the establishment anyway, are you no, not? No, 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 I just write about it. I'm not, I'm not the establishment. You know better than that. You are, what was that I called you once? 
You said I, that I wrote scurrilous books. Scurrilous. That was scurrilous the, books, yes. yes. <laughs> Chronicler of the rich and the now bankrupt. <laughs> I have time for one segment of calls to Peter Newman after the break. <laughs> Peter Newman will be wearing his beaver hat when he autographs at the bay. Is that today? That's yeah. today, yeah. Yeah. There it is. Between 11 and 12 and half past three to half past four at W.H. Smith in Port Royal. Wear the hat. All right. Don't buy a book from him <laughs> if he's not wearing the hat. How much is the book, anyway? It's twenty-four ninety-five, but everybody's discounting it, so it's uh, really low. It's gone cheap already? Yes. Why is that? Well, I think uh, people use it uh, as a kind of a... Uh, lost leader. Lost leader, yeah. <laughs> Where am I going? Go ahead to Peter Newman. First of all, I'd like to concur with Mr. Newman that the Eskimos and the Inuit are definitely hooked on cigarettes and soft drinks. I just returned from there, and the bay has them loaded in the beginning when you walk into the bay. And they seem to spend all their money and all their time smoking and drinking uh, sugar-ridden food. My question to Mr. Newman is, does he think that the... Uh, country and the Bay is doing a fair job of merchandising the Inuit and the Eskimo art and craft. Yeah, they are, but the problem is that the, the market is a bit flooded. Uh, they, they made too much and they try to sell it to too hard and now people are turned off and they want to go to new things. So it's, 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 it's an irony that as the quality of the art improves, uh, it is not uh, selling as well as it should. Go ahead, please. Yeah, 1982, I... Uh in Edmonton joined up and went north with the Bay. I'd just like to say they're a very, very different company out there than they are down here. I was really amazed. That's and right. They're I'm not sure, but I think even, oh, say as long as five years ago, they're still bringing Scotsmen over. Yeah. They stopped that now because the Department of Immigration said they had to give jobs to Canadians. But it's very true. There are two companies. There is the Northern Company with those 120 stores, which is not that different from the company I'm writing about. And then there's the department store chain, which is the same as Eaton's or anything else. Uh, why did you not stay with the Bay? Uh, they had, uh, they were going through some financial trouble, and they cut back, and I was a new hire. And also, uh, <clears throat> you have to be a sort of a special kind of person, toe the line very, very closely up there. It's your, if you belong to the Bay, in the town I was in, Fort Simpson, uh, you were more or less by yourself. You, you know, the people, it was a very adversarial position because of, uh, things that they had done in the past. Mm -hmm. Okay, bye. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, Peter Newman, I've got my television turned down today, and I want to ask him the question about the Royal Marine Light Infantry being in uh, Friday Harbor, uh, the San Juans, between 1860 and yes. 1872, and uh, Hudson Bay had a pig shot. That's and it right. was known as the Pig War. That was the Great Pig War. It was, was really uh, Sir James Douglas uh, responding uh, to the Americans who shot a Hudson Bay pig. Yes. And it very nearly uh, accelerated into a real war between the British and the was Americans. Was that where the Kaiser came up and drew the line? That's right. That's the right. Kaiser uh, was the one who brought peace. Uh, it's interesting when you go now to English camp on San Juan Island, uh, how beautiful and peaceful it is. And uh, you go to the American camp, which was on a little cliff, and how uh, cold and miserable it must have been there. Well, thank you, old Marine. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'm an ex-member of uh, the Honorable Company, Gentlemen Adventures Trading into North America. And uh, Mr. Newman, I, uh, I was in the Bay here quite a few years ago, of course. And uh, say as late as 1960, I found that the company didn't press the sale of cigarettes or candy to the Bay, to put tobacco, yes. In fact, if you smoked TaylorMade, you had a hell of a time buying them in some of the posts. Yeah, well, I think that's changed. Uh, it changed about the time the Diefenbaker invasion of the North came. And uh, all the uh, Inuit and uh, Indian were sort of centralized. Yeah, I think that's part of it. The, the other interesting thing about the Bay was that until 1965, their stores were unheated. They deliberately put no stoves into their stores because they didn't want the Indians or the Inuit sitting around in nice, comfortable stores. They wanted them out on the fur trap lines. So they literally didn't have any heated stores. That sounded like a good technique. And you quit the bay, did you? 
Yes, I quit the Bay uh, several years ago. I was back in the Arctic uh, on a different uh, mm. operation here a few years ago, and uh, I was absolutely astounded at the change of the uh, of the Inuit and their values and everything. And uh, they've gone down. Uh, gone? No, in uh, in the far north and some of the posts and that. Uh, I mean, uh, you stepped off the boat, and they said uh, they could tell you where to buy some grass or whatever you wanted. <laughs> okay, much obliged. One gets disabused with these pieces of incidental yeah. information. Don't tell me they do dope up oh, there. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Hey? That's, that's the only way to survive up there. Yeah, sir. Go ahead, please. Hello. Good yeah. morning, Jack. I have a question for Mr. Newman. Yes. I, I'm curious to know how the government of the time uh, established their land claim. Uh, so that, you know, that enabled them to uh, um, give a grant to the Hudson Bay Company? That's a very good question, and uh, there is no real answer, because uh, King Charles II had no right to give that uh, land away. Uh, he didn't even have a right of discovery, because the Hudson Bay Company did not discover it. In those days, there was something called the right of discovery. Um, and then now, uh, there is uh, a real question whether that land did not, in fact, belong to the Indians, and they're challenging the original Hudson Bay land claim. I don't know how far it'll get, but it's it's certainly a, a question worth asking. Go ahead from Kelowna. Good morning, Mr. Newman. I have enjoyed your yarn about the copper frying pan, but uh, I just thought I'd like to say as an apple grower from Kelowna and experienced with how trees grow, that when a branch grows out of a tree, um, its height off the ground never changes as the tree grows. So I think you'll have to go back to some other way that oh! frying pan got to the top oh. of the tree. This, this uh, has been said to me many times, and all I can say is that uh, Ed Bovey told me that story, and I, I don't know how the frying pan got up there. <laughs> well, I enjoyed the yarn, and I uh, certainly enjoyed listening to you. Thanks. I've got to think that one out. <laughs> <laughs> that one's got me baffled completely. Here's a tree. Here's a branch. The branch comes out. Yeah, it comes out of the yeah. top each year. It's yeah. new well, growth. Right. It? It's, who knows? I wasn't there. I think that guy's right. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Hello. Hello. That's you. Yes. Oh, fun. About 25 years ago, I was working in London in a place called Garlic Hill. Yes. And round the corner from the little car park I was commanding officer of was a wee door with uh, the Hudson's Bay thing all around the uh, door. And I think it said the Gentleman Adventures of the Hudson's Bay. Yes. And for some reason, I was under the impression this was still the headquarters of the Hudson's Bay Company. It was. Uh, it was uh, headquarters until 1970. That's uh, Beaver House in London, and it has now been torn down. But until 1970, the house, uh, that house um, housed not only the head, head office, but all of the auctions were held there. But it was an extraordinarily small building. You know, well, it was a small building, but it had a big building behind it, and it had a big basement. I hope they saved the door. I hope so. It was very ornate. Much of, what were you commanding? A p car park? Yes. <laughs> but all, all my customers were fur traders. They all lived around this, this uh, little garlic hill area. That's you mean right. you were taking the, the diamonds or the pennies for the car park? I did better than that. One of the fur traders asked me if I'd like to take over this company. And to, as usual, with my tremendous business acumen, I said, no, I wasn't really interested in that. <laughs> and that hill, uh, there was a <laughs> restaurant called the Strathcona Grill. And Strathcona was, of course, the great uh, Canadian uh, owner of the Hudson's Bay Company. He owned the CPR, the Bank of Montreal, and the Hudson's Bay Company at the same time. <laughs> the CPR, the Bank of Montreal, and the Hudson's yes. Bay Company. Strathcona. Yes. Well, Peter, uh, you're always a delight to have here. Dealt with you kind of lightly this morning, but as long as we sell you a few books, <laughs> what do you care? <laughs> <laughs> the Bay downtown, 11 to 12. I hate these people. Well, I don't want to lose my reputation as writing scurrilous books. So. Uh, no, well, this is not a scurrilous book. 3.30 to 4.30, W.H. Smith, Park Royal. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Jack. I doff my beaver to you. <laughs> oh, what a funny morning this morning. Where is that, Monroe? Let's carry on with How to Marry Rich. <laughs> After the break. I'm conducting this interview at the specific request of a number of women on the staff of BC Television. They want to learn how to marry rich, so at vast expense, somebody else's, we have flown in from Montreal, Thomas Schnurmacher, Leitzmaker, with the Gold Diggers Guide on How to Marry Rich. 
Tell these poor souls how to snag a rich husband. Well, there are several uh, steps, you know, everybody's mother has told them that it's just as easy to fall in love with uh, somebody who's rich as it is with somebody who's poor, but they didn't tell them how. This book tells them how to do it, what to say, what not to say, where to meet the rich, how the rich are different uh, from the poor, and it also explains why being rich is fun and how to take advantage of, of having money and how to enjoy it. Uh, tell me about yourself. Are you married? Uh, no, I'm not married. You're uh, single? Yes, but Agatha... Have you been married? No, but Agatha Christie never killed anybody. Uh, are Agatha you living common law? No, no, I'm living uh, in the law. If you marry, uh, do you have any money? I, I will after this book after and this after this interview. You will then become an eligible person whom someone can marry rich. Yes, but I have the antidote to the book as well. What's the antidote to the book? Reading the book. <laughs> if you've read the book, then you're prepared for anybody else who's reading it. No, quite seriously, though. How does the girl go about it? Because nowadays, how many single people are there in North America? There's over 40 million single people, at last count. I mean, that was yesterday. They may That's be men, more. And, men and women? Yes. And how many of these would be eligible singles in Canada? Uh, well, that four million. That means four million in Canada. That, divide that by 10%, that's 400,000 half women, 200,000. Uh, people who are not anxious about marriage, stuff is 100,000 in BC. Yes, well, the, the, the biggest problem is when you're looking for somebody single and rich is you often end up meeting somebody who's married and poor, which is a very unfortunate uh, combination. So that's why the book uh, tells somebody how to spot a liar. In how do you spot a liar? Well, there's several ways. Uh, for, I mentioned for a woman to spot a liar, she should look if, there, if a man has a tan line on his fourth finger. Uh, if there are, no, you, you don't, so no. you're not a liar. No. Uh, if there, Never wore a if ring, she goes it. out on a date with somebody and there are children's toys in the back seat, uh, chances are he's not a bachelor. Uh, if there are children in the back seat, e even more so. If it takes That'll five hit. toll booths to get to his favorite restaurant, and the, and the dead giveaway, Jack, is if a woman is out on a date with a man and he pays for everything in cash and uses a blowtorch to destroy the motel receipt, Chances are this man is married, so there's no point. There's no point in pursuing this. Uh, one. Oh, that's very good. Any any joker that use, that doesn't use his credit card for a, a hideaway weekend or a fancy meal because he doesn't want his wife or his common law to see to the receipt around yeah, so the house. To find out. So then you are you're barking up the wrong tree, whether there's a kettle on top of it or not. Yeah. Okay. But if she decides that he's single, and he hasn't got a ring line, and he uses his credit card here and there, how does she find out if he's rich? Well, she can, I mentioned in the book, she can do a Dun & Bradstreet rating and find out exactly how much money uh, he has, and this will, won't cost her too much. And she's also got to be uh, very careful once she has met somebody who is rich. Meeting somebody who's rich isn't enough. You've got to uh, bag the guy, and that's why the book points out how to play hard to get. On the first date, you don't do much. Well, just a minute. Play hard? I thought nobody played hard to get nowadays. Well, well that's why they don't, aren't marrying rich. Playing hard to get is extremely important. Okay. And wa weight is important. You know, if a woman wants to marry rich, she's got to keep in shape. You know, if somebody's so fat they have their own postal code, uh, they, they've, got to, they've got to lose weight. That's why they're, you know, I mentioned uh, various diets and and exercise plans. And this Rubin. is a real sexist book. This is no, it's not. It's, hated it's by a, the liberation. Oh, no, no, it's, it's the most liberated book, and I'll tell you why it is, because for many, many years, men have been marrying women for a very superficial reason, their looks. So I think there's a double standard. Now women have every right to marry a man for a superficial, superficial reason, his money. And uh, I, te you know, I teach them how to go about uh, destroying this double standard, and there's nothing wrong with money, there's nothing wrong with marrying for money. But you say that appearance is terribly important, of course. Yes, you've got to, you know, you've got to put your best foot forward. But the appearance of the man she's going to snag doesn't no, matter no, as long as he's got he's, money. He's got the money, right. She can see it through his wallet. He will look better through his wallet. <laughs> I see. Okay, some other tips. How willing should a lady be on her early dates with uh, the guy whom she thinks is rich and single? Absolutely unwilling. Absolutely not. She should do nothing of any kind on the first date, or the second, or the third. The guy's got to be panting for it by the time. Otherwise, he's just not, not interested. And rich people, that's why you have to be in shape, too. Rich people don't like to marry people who are well-fed already. So they, they like to marry somebody who's uh, in shape, and they like to have something they cannot get. If they can get it too easily, they don't want it. Now, what about going to special places to nab them, like... Uh, Miami, you're from the East, aren't you? Yes, I am. Miami wouldn't help. All you'd meet in Miami are other gold diggers. Uh, uh, the Kahala Hilton in Hawaii? Th that's not too bad. I suggest the, uh, Lexington, the Hyatt in Lexington, Kentucky during the yearling sales. 
Any place where they're selling horses for two, three million dollars each in the neighborhood oh. is a good place for go gold shot. digging. They are dead right where the money is there. That's right. And then, of course, you've got to dress yourself up as a horsey woman, all leather and uh, suede and jungle no, boots. I think, no, no, I think just au contraire, everybody around there is dressed up uh, yeah. too horsey. So I think décolleté is the, is the rule for that particular lobby. I also suggest there are two hotels in Lexington that you book a room in both so they can, uh, so to speak, work both lobbies. Uh. <laughs> well, we've just had a problem with Bill C-49 in Vancouver. But you're suggesting... That's not what I meant by, by no, working in lobbies. You, you, you meant making oneself available for admiration and... D exactly, and exactly. Mm -hmm, Cooth meetings. <laughs> That's right. You don't drop a hanky anymore, do you? No, because nobody will pick it up. It'll just lay there in the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> on a go... On a go you're very funny. <laughs> what have I forgotten about? What have I forgotten about? I don't know. There are, there are other hints about what, what to say and uh, what to oh, do. Yes. certain phrases that should not be uh, said. Go on. Uh, when in conversation with the rich man, you never s don't say the word uh, relationship. Don't use the word gold digger. Don't use the word aisle, as in walk down the aisle. Uh, rich people get very turned off. Even if you're in a supermarket, you say corridor. You just never say, <laughs> say aisle. Things that you should say instead are, yes, uh, oh, really? Did you do that? That's fascinating. Uh, or, and the best one, no, 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 I'll do it. Yeah. Uh, that, that often works uh, as well. So these are the phrases uh, that are important to be used. And there's also an A to Z listing for all kinds of things you might want to look up. Uh, for alimony, I have the address and phone number of Marvin Mil Mitchelson. For American Express, I've changed the uh, saying somewhat to, don't leave him without it. <laughs> You're on, you're good. When a man cares enough to send the very best, what should he be sending you? Hey, well, I'm, there's a quiz at the back, and I ask what should he be sending you, whether it should it be flowers, should it be a card, it should be neither, it should be a, a diamond wedding ring inside a Big Mac. Uh, that, that indicates that he has money and he thinks he's clever. And he'd be a good catch, wouldn't he? He would be a good catch. Yeah, the age doesn't matter. No, age is irrelevant. No, no, what work you're doing you're is irrelevant. Uh, too bad, uh, I don't know if Mr. Newman has left, but there's a, uh, there was a lady working as a waitress at Ye Old Nosebag Pub in Finchingfield, Essex. And she was serving drinks, and one of the uh, gentlemen she was serving drinks to was Edgar Bronfman. Uh, they got married, and they recently celebrated their 10th anniversary. So needless to say, she's not selling beer anymore. And uh, the Ye Old Edgar Bronfman is worth untold zillions. They That's own the right. world, don't they? They they own a lot. They own a lot, and she got it by being a waitress. So sometimes you don't even have to be the uh, in certain areas. You can be in a pub, and it and it could happen as long as you as you know what to do. What's the best occupation though, out from which to start? Modeling is an excellent uh, occupation. Rock star. The, if if uh, you're interested in rock stars and rock stars, though not necessarily bright, are often extremely wealthy, and uh, relatively easily parted. Uh, from their money, and it's strange you've heard the expression of fool and his money are soon parted. Well, the use of the word his is because rich women are far harder to separate from their money than rich men are. They're tougher. They're much tougher. They're much more careful. Barbara Hutton is the exception that proves the rule. When one walks down the corridor in the church, avoiding the use of the word aisle, <laughs> right. should, should one, uh, when one gets, oh no, should one get a marriage settlement if one... Oh, yes, one gets it all signed uh, before and legally uh, signed very, very carefully before so that you don't sign away something. And, and there are certain <coughs> key things to, to remember to get to that aisle. When, so when uh, a prospective millionaire asks, how do you like your rice? You can say boiled or uh, fried, but the best thing to say is thrown. Uh, you know, that's the best way to uh, have the rice. But you can't, it, when you're gold digging, you must not let the prospective husband know that you are gold digging. So I suggest that they hide the book and not leave it lying around, you know, where rich people might tend to see it. It's, uh, and rich people tend to marry other rich people, rich people. if left unattended. So you really have to uh, work hard at it, but it's worth it. I mean, they'll never have to get up for 9 o'clock ever again. They can just sit back and, and watch your show without having to, uh, get without out having to go to work. Charming, uh, really very bright, uh, Thomas Schnurmacher. In Hungary, you know, Webster is a very unusual Webster, name. Webster. Yes. <laughs> Webster. He said, Majorat sagt, felt I'm a After the break. Calls, 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 calls. Calls, calls, calls. Great. <laughs> That's surprising. There's not a flood of calls on how to marry rich. Must be many of you desperate out there don't want to do it. Well, they don't, they don't want to admit it. 
It's, it's something it that people tend to keep to themselves. Well, let's try it anyway. I think we'll get enough calls. Uh, am I on the right one? No, I'm not. Go ahead to, to Tom. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We've, uh, my mother and I have been enjoying you so much. I'm so glad that uh, Mr. Monroe hasn't arrived yet because I'm sure we wouldn't have had as much of you as we have. <laughs> oh, I, I am too, madam. Yes, yeah, <laughs> uh, I am going to buy your book because there are several young ladies at my church who are single and I think we're going to find this uh, book most enjoyable. How much is it? Thank you. It's twelve ninety-five. Oh, that's cheap for uh, a millionaire, uh, isn't oh, it? Absolutely. And I also think that you'd be a most appropriate guest on Johnny Carson's show. I'm sure he'd find <laughs> you most amusing. Well, if you'd like to see me on the Johnny Carson show, write to him. I am definitely going to do that. <laughs> okay, I think, thank you. Uh, matter of fact, I think he's more suited to Joan Rivers' <laughs> presence <laughs> on the Johnny Carson show. Anyway, it's been most enjoyable. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank, thank you very you much. So much. For... Thank you so much. Where am I going? Oh, a call from the country. Go ahead from Gibson's, please. Yes, hello. You seem to be very well versed as to how the women can marry the rich. Uh, I'd like to ask you how a man can go about marrying, marrying a rich heiress or well, that's a much, rich free male. Yes, well, that's much more difficult. There is a chapter in the book on, on gigolos, but like I said, women are much more clever about holding on uh, to their money. So there's uh, a man, a male gold digger has his work cut out for him. Uh, there are fewer rich women who are alone. They usually don't have any problem meeting anybody and uh, they can see through any gold diggers plans uh, very quickly so the, the work is much much more difficult so, so a male would practically have to be rich to marry a rich female yeah. that's right if i were you i'd stay in gibson's <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> much obliged <laughs> go ahead please yes hello i'm trying to find out now how about a woman with children marrying a rich man no, no problem uh, whatsoever. Hide the children for the first few meetings, and once you've uh, nabbed the guy, then you slowly introduce the children one at a time, starting from the oldest and working your way down. Ah, good idea. <laughs> There's even a chapter on, you know, on love in the book. It's a very short chapter. Do you mean sex? No, no, I mean, I mean love and, and affection. You know. I suggest that people are interested in that buy a Hallmark card instead of the book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Bye-bye. Where do you write your gossip column? In Montreal, for the Montreal Gazette. For the Montreal Gazette. Okay. Go ahead, please. Hello. I'm just wondering uh, what the gentleman said. How do you really meet nice gentlemen, even if they're not rich? Because, you know, I'm comfortable and I drive a car, and but it's just so hard to meet nice gentlemen. Okay. Go, you don't want to go to bars. You don't want to I go to church. I'm, there are some men at church, but... What, how do you do that? That's well, what I want well, to know. Well, that's uh, no problem. I'll let you in on a, on a secret. Uh, if you go to any supermarket at 6 o'clock, the men who are there are definitely single and available because if a man is married, he's going to be home having supper. And if he has a girlfriend, he'll be at his girlfriend's house or she'll be at his place. If he's there all alone walking up and down the aisle, excuse me, corridor, at the supermarket, that means that he's uh, single. So just bump you your card up into a his. And That's right. Ask him about you know the cornflakes and so on. <laughs> and before you know it, you might have one shopping cart instead of two. I see. Hit, hit well, I just re finished reading Shirley MacLaine's book, and it's just fantastic. And I'm just wondering what all my past lives have got to do with it all. Well, because hit them, I'm sure not getting anywhere these days. I'll give you a tip. <laughs> hit them in the shins with your shopping cart so severely that he bleeds. And then you can help him. <laughs> then you can take him to hospital. Oh, no, that would be kind of cruel. <laughs> yes, that's well, a bit drastic. Well, thanks a lot. I'll try it. Thank right, you. Thanks right. for calling. On the other hand, his wife, his wife might just be away for a few days. All oh, effort wasted. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, because Probably because I'm not a gold digger, I've had two very rich men wanting to marry me. And they've both been pompous boors. And I'm wondering if uh, there's such a thing as a nice rich man. Y yes, there is. The fact that you did not want to marry, uh, marry them is the reason, uh, I'm sure, part of the reason that they wanted to marry you. That's why I instruct people not to act over eager that the gold digger should act as if she is not a gold digger at all and express no interest whatsoever. The less interest she expresses, the more interested uh, the man will be. And uh, whether the, a rich man is boorish or not, I think there are poor people who are just as boorish. And if given the choice, go for the rich one because you'll have more money to do something with to avoid the boorish man. Well, I've heard it's just as easy to love a rich man. Oh, oh, well, why is. didn't you marry one of them? Well, because they weren't very nice. Details. Right, we want some <laughs> what was wrong with these rich men? Pardon? Did they, were they heavy drinkers? No, they were just boors. They were just 
pompous boors. They, they, they were just very unpleasant people. They weren't very interesting? Not very interesting. Well, you could spend a lot of the time shopping instead. A lot of the time shopping and very talking about themselves and wanting Oh, well, that's very important. You have to, to not buy say buy things for me all the time. Well, there are a lot of women who wouldn't complain about that. I'm a very independent person, and yeah. I don't like... Go marry a poor man and suffer and... and Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, love. She had a good voice, though. Go ahead, please. Hi. Um, I missed the name of the book. It's how... It's the Gold Digger's Guide. Gold Digger's Guide. Guide. Um, I was wondering, how would you... Um, where would you go to meet somebody, let's say, in Vancouver? In, in Vancouver? Where would you go in Vancouver? Well, I would suggest that you go to private uh, clubs, yacht clubs, uh, golf clubs, any, anything where uh, that is private and where it's membership only and it's hard to get into. Uh-huh, so I wouldn't have any trouble getting into it? Uh, well, no, I don't, th I don't think uh, you would. You, you can ask uh, to speak to the manager and uh, suggest you're interested and if he could just show you around uh, the club oh, and you're yeah. not sure if you want to join or not. Yeah, one and of these athletic it, clubs, steam yeah. bath clubs, yes, and beautiful racquetball clubs. And depending on, you know, how much of an investment you want to make, uh, you can join the club or just keep visiting every now and then. Uh, because, you know, at this point in time, like, I've got a nice place, I've got a nice car, but, um, you know, my funds are somewhat limited, right? Um, you well, know, this so book sets out to change all that. I sort of wanted to uh, stay in the Vancouver area, at least, you know, for now, anyway, right? And then you, w you work so your I way guess, up to Kentucky. Uh, the best thing to do would be to buy the book. That's, that's the first step, yes. Uh, tell <laughs> me, you have been married, haven't you? Yes, I have. You have no children? I've got one child, five. You're 31? I'm only 30 now, so... 31. You know, I didn't have that much trouble before, but they were only sort of... Uh, you know, mediocre. They were actually, my husband was actually spending his parents' money. So that sort of, you know. Yeah, I know what you mean. Are you working? That's terrible, especially um, if it's no, not enough. No, actually, I'm, um, well, I'm a housekeeper right now. Uh, you sound very nice. Maybe some guests will come to the house whom you can nail. <laughs> All the best, love. Thanks very much. I'll be back after the break with Schnurmacher. You watch me annoy the women's livers. <laughs> Every spinster in town <laughs> should, should, should be... Wash out your mouth with soap, Webster. Every spinster in town should be given this book for Christmas. Because well, you know, we want to do all we can to wipe out this promiscuity and this common law living, which I think is abominable. Well, don't you? Yes, I, I think it is abominable, but it's not only for spinsters. I mean, a lot of women have approached You said the word. You're not allowed to say spinsters. Oh, oh I, well, you said it. Spinsters, spinsters is a derogatory a word. word. Okay, Sing, single ladies. Single women. Mm -hmm. you know, well, I suggest that they, they have to... Uh, now you've made me lose my train of thought, and it was just brilliant what I had to say, too. It doesn't matter. It happens to me all the time. Go ahead, to Tommy. Yeah, good morning, Jack. You've got no right on this program. Unless you're a rich man, off uh, the... Hey, I'm just saying thanks a lot. You got me uh, uh, off the hook here. I know what to get my ex-wife for Christmas. That's all the woman talks about. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> thanks a lot, Jack. Thanks. Oh, good. Yeah. Good Christmas for ex-wives. <laughs> You know, it's, it's not only for single women. You know, a lot of women have approached me and said, you know, why didn't you write this book 10 years ago? Uh, it's too late that they're already married and they've married poor. Well, there's a chapter in it on creative divorce. Uh, and, you know, you may have made a mistake the first time, but you can go for it the second time. So marriage is no excuse. Go ahead, please. Is that me? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Jack, I think you better lock your office door. <laughs> why? <laughs> well, you're going to be swamped. Oh, 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 that's a hard nut to catch, I'll tell you. <laughs> okay, Jack. <laughs> Go ahead, please. And that me? That's you, Ma. Yeah, I was just going to say the same thing. How do we meet Jack Webster? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I suggest you start slow and work your way up to Learn Jack to Webster. Gaelic? Yeah, you'll yeah. take more than that, I think. <laughs> no comment. Anyway. Uh, and that's not for publication. Do you have a question for we, Tommy? Not particularly. I've just been made aware yeah, that so I'm keeping in you. away from all the men. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Thanks, love. <laughs> Go ahead from the wilds of Powell River. Oh, good morning, Jack. Well, I watch your show off and I enjoy it very much. Uh, Mr. Shoemaker, uh, I believe people should be uh, marrying people that they feel they're compatible with. Oh, so do I, but uh, why shouldn't they be richer and compatible? 
I'm not suggesting they marry somebody they're incompatible with. We're not. Why not marry somebody who's is, compatible and rich? Okay. This is, well, if they're not rich. Excuse me, sir. This is not a session to create happy marriage. This is a session for women to nab rich men. That's what it's for. I mean, let's get our terms of reference right. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, I wonder why Mr. Shoemaker hasn't addressed the question of men looking for rich women. Uh, I have addressed it. He says it's too difficult. Women are much more meaner and won't give away any of their money, <laughs> even to a handsome young gigolo, or only to a handsome young gigolo on a fee basis. That's right, and even that is just temporary part-time work. <laughs> okay. Any other questions, ma'am? No, I think he's covered it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Good morning, Mr. Webster. I was just wondering what your guest's inspiration in writing this book was. Well, my inspiration was I, I noticed that you know men had been marrying women for for reasons of looks only, and that women were work these days were working too hard. And uh, I decided that they needed more luxury and wealth and diamonds and clothes and furs instead of having to get up early in the morning and go to work. So I decided to do something about it, a and uh, wrote the book. That was the inspiration. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Jack. Morning. I'm really disappointed I'm watching daytime TV, but your program is just too interesting to turn off. Um, your guess is a little disconcerting, I believe. I hope this is all tongue-in-cheek. Oh, uh, absolutely not. It depends on uh, who's, uh, who's listening. Uh, in, for, in your case, uh, if you, you know, it, it depends on the individual, really. I think everybody has a right to marry for whatever reasons they want to marry. Well, just in my case, I'm very married to a very wealthy man. I have the diamonds and I have a Seville Cadillac. But really, the girls these days are looking for a man that is already rich. I would suggest they look for some quality, some potential. Um, they themselves have to upgrade themselves so that they're dealing with someone who is on, on their equal. I see a lot of girls just going around looking for someone that will put them on easy street. And I see some of them even looking at my husband. Let me tell you where I put them because it's just <laughs> not, it's not the answer. You can be happy, rich or poor. Oh, well, no, you can be happy. You can, you can be <laughs> happy. Don't get me wrong. You but can he was be happy when I married him. Rich, but also uh, in the book, I make it a point to say that a, a rich man who's married to somebody else is of is of no use to the gold digger. Ah, so your you husband see, is safe. What this delightful thirty-eight-year-old woman with two kids? Me? No, I'm thirty-nine <laughs> and I have five, but I look like I have one. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's why I was fooled. <laughs> but I was dead on on your age, you see. Well, you just keep your hands off Jack Webster. He's cute and probably rich. Keep your hands off my husband, ladies, and just continue to listen to the program. <laughs> I like her. Go ahead, please. Hi, what uh, chance does Mr. Shoemaker think that women over 45 have in finding a rich husband if they've been married before and no children? Uh, they have an excellent chance. It's a matter of how exciting and how interesting they can make themselves to be. Uh, age is really uh, no barrier. You also find that many men, uh, rich men, have not married till uh, their 50s or 60s. And while some of them want to marry very young girls, uh, some of them are embarrassed at the prospect and will marry uh, a more mature woman. Where do we look? Well, you, in the book. How's your golf swing? <laughs> How's table of contents. How's your golf swing? Terrible. <laughs> well, practice Perfect. Up you just have to sit in the bar anyway at the golf club. No, There's no, no, no. no. Practice up in your golf swing. All right. Thanks okay. very much. Thanks okay. for calling. Bye. Right. This is great fun, isn't it? Yeah. Dude, I hope Monroe never gets here. <laughs> 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 Go ahead, please. Hi, Tom, Jack. I love your sense of humor, and I'll buy the book if it's as, as amusing as this half hour has been. Uh, however, I'd like to take a little clip from your book and say, I'm not, I'm not interested in you at all, but I'd like to leave my number for when you become rich after selling your book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Just write some kid of the Montreal Gazette. <laughs> okay. And write the... Uh, Mention that you saw me on Jack Webster. I'll open it first. <laughs> open it first. Now, I have a millionaire candidate available for all kinds of things on this line here. Go ahead, millionaire. Good morning, Jack. How are you? My name is John. I'm a marine architect and engineer. I have two young boys, and I'm 35 years old, and fairly comfortable uh, in financial uh, reasons. And I was just wondering if you could help me out. Uh, that, this I is think a, you should call our receptionist. There are about 80 calls for you. There's a, this is a model and ethical question. Do we know who this caller is? Do we know who he is? No. Jeanette wants to know if she should get his name. Well, I think anonymity yes. should be uh, uh, sort of first and foremost.
foremost here. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll guard your anonymity, but uh, we have, do we have a shot of uh, Jeanette? Jeanette uh, will you get his name for me, please? <laughs> I have two boys. No. I have tried. I have a blank, belong to the Vancouver Yacht Club and play golf at the Vancouver Berquitlam Club as well. And I've been looking for an eligible, intelligent, good-looking gal for a long time. Jeanette, this is it. This is it. History in the making. <laughs> but tell me this. How many times have you been married? Uh, once. Once. Anybody why, can make a mistake. The, no, no, oh, psychological. Why did it break up? Well, why did it break up? Was it money or sex? Oh, a bit of both, of course. Money and sex? Of course. Uh, and you're established, you have your own home? That's correct. Is there a mortgage in your house? No. No mortgage in your house. Where did you spend your last <laughs> vacation? Bermuda. Bermuda. By yourself or did you take some popsy with you? <laughs> oh, my partner and I sailed down on uh, the 50-foot yacht that we have. Jeanette. It's take... a 50-foot yacht, go for it. <laughs> you yeah. take his number. <laughs> No, I can't help you. I, I'm not in the business of dating. As a matter of fact, there's a very serious trial going on in Victoria just now <laughs> involving taking telephone number appointments. And I don't wish to be involved even on the peripheral fringes of that kind of caper. But it's okay. Leave... I don't wear a, a tall hat. Okay. <laughs> leave your number with Jeanette and okay. watch and look out for yourself. Betcha. Bye now. No. Tell me, how much time have we got left? Tommy, that was great fun. Thank you. Tommy Schnurmacher, <laughs> lace maker, 12.95. He's a very witty guy for a fellow from Montreal. <laughs> Shows you that some of them are quite bright indeed. And do well at Christmas. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Great being here. Find yourself a rich broad in Marion. <laughs> <laughs> Probably do better than your book. Change of pace, change of face. Monroe's here after the break. Jack Monroe is the regional president of the IWA, and he's been out of the province for some considerable time, and we've not had the benefit, if it is a benefit, of his views on the TFL 24 Lyle Island situation. And one can't just ignore the situation because it won't, not, will not go away. Just by the way, Jack, the roads this morning were pretty awful. Yeah, they were a disaster, Jack. Um, I, I was driving my truck, so I didn't have any problem getting around, but uh, people couldn't get up onto the, the upper levels. Uh, Highway uh, Lions Gate was backed up to 15th Street, so you couldn't get on the Marine Drive, and uh, basically a hell of a mess on the North Shore. Right now, where have you been for the past two weeks, if I may dare to ask? Oh, I'm on an unemployment insurance commission, uh, Jack, that's, that's looking at the, all aspects of unemployment insurance, and I've spent the last two weeks in the Maritime Provinces. I mean, it's a royal commission, is it? Yes, parliamentary commission. A parliamentary commission. And um, the last week we were in uh, Newfoundland, Newfoundland. Uh, we think we got troubles, but uh, we, that, I guess everybody thinks you got troubles until you hear somebody else's. That is tough stuff down there, tough Tom, stuff. Just give me a minute about Newfoundland. Oh, in, uh, inshore fishermen, as they call them, uh, work uh, from May till the end of September and make uh, $3,500, $4,000 maybe. Uh, we talked to the government. They, uh, they have a $60 million uh, kind of a project fund, building fund or something, and uh, so it's a little good for their economy. Unemployment insurance, though, brings in $555 million into Newfoundland. It's 40% uh, of the fishermen's wages, 10% of of the, the income earned in Newfoundland is unemployment insurance. And without unemployment insurance, it would be a disaster, either. A disaster, Jack? Um, uh, that's right, $550 million. And, uh, you know, they, uh, they say a building fund of $60 million is a drop in the bucket compared to, to unemployment. Uh, the, the, the problem is, um, one of the problems we were in the community, uh, the name of it uh, makes me smile, but we're in a community that had a, a seal hide processing plant that is now shut down. Uh, the amount of seals that are now in the ocean off the Atlantic, uh, off the uh, eastern seaboard, uh, obviously are eating a hell of a lot more fish. Uh, there isn't as many fish. Uh, the, the fish that don't get eaten are eating the excrement from the seals, and uh, which are developing worms and parasites, and so the... Uh, the packing and uh, uh, all the rest of things it. Things are, are bad. Okay. Thing, things are bad, and, uh, you and have, when you take man out of controlling 
like seals, nature, it, it destroys it. it. It's a mess. People are tough shape. Since you left, logging restarted in Lyle Island. <coughs> Hiders yes. began to blockade it. We've now got nearly 60 people arrested. We have actions for civil contempt, and we have uh, minimum logging going ahead on Lyle Island. Um, do you think that the logging company should just back away from this confrontation altogether so that the uh, authorities, the attorney general, and the courts don't have a continuing problem? Not at all, Jack, and, uh, and you, we can't back away from it. And uh, be before we talk about that too much, uh, a lot of people are saying that you are doing a hell of a good job on it. You've had both sides on it. Your, your biases aren't showing too much, and uh, your... your uh, well, my you're, bias, you're, you're doing an excellent job. No, Your biases are for logging. I my understand. bias is there for to create jobs in right. this dreadful winter in British Columbia. Right. Maybe not as bad as Newfoundland, but bad enough. But how many jobs have we lost in the logging industry in the past couple of years? Log logging in sawmills. Oh, close to twenty thousand, eighteen thousand. Uh, is the Lyle Island operation, which is only employing a handful of men, important? Well, At the moment, it's only employing because of the difficulties. If, if we got a couple of minutes, Jack, and I guess after that last pro part of your program, we can't get all excited and nasty this morning. It's, that was a good note, a good fun note. But, but there, there is so much hype going on out there that people are, are forgetting some, some really basic things. Uh, uh, one is that we've been logging, or there has been logging going on in, in the Moresby since 1930. In the 40s, it was, it was heavily logged uh, for the Sitka spruce, for these mosquito bombers, and everybody knows the bombers are made out of spruce from, from, uh, from the Queen Charlottes. Uh, we, get, we get a guy like Turner, who is high profile, leader of the opposition, rents a boat for $1,300 a week, goes in- One person, 1300 per person per a person, week. Per person, per person and puts around uh, in the Queen Charlotte and says, that's beautiful stuff, stop the logging, uh, the hiders are right. And, and almost everything that he looked at from the water has been logged up this, the, the mountain, about a thousand feet. The, the low-lying creeks were logged, the, the low valleys were logged, and that's all regeneration. It's, it's, good, it's good country for growing, for growing timber. The, the, the logging part that we're talking about, Jack, uh, the tree farm license number, number 24, is is only 22 percent of what we talk about when we talk about the South Moresby. Lyle is is 10 or 12 percent of of the tree farm license. Logging is about half of one percent. The of all per the year, trees on Moresby. Per year. Now the tree oh, farm. The trees in the license. In the, of the license, right? The the now when you when they grant a tree farm license, you get it because you're you make some commitments. I think the commitments for new plants, for modern plants, for the rest of this stuff is something like $600 million that have been committed. And, and the logs from, from Lyle Island, where we've been logging for 50 years, have to satisfy that commitment in those manufacturing plants. That's how the economy works. And, and um, I resent the fact that, that the Turner goes up for a week and, and doesn't know what he's looking at. Uh, that uh, that Kasia says that civil disobedience in this case uh, is maybe acceptable. It's not acceptable. What about your man Sven Robinson, NDP MP? Sven Robinson was up there on his own behalf, and he should not have been there either, because he's not right on this issue. You you as much as we don't like it, and we're usually the ones who end up in the bucket for contempt of court, the trade union movement, or 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 its members. You, you can't flaunt the law, but, but there is a case. The Supreme Court has said that, that the native peoples have a legitimate beef. The, the Supreme Court, in a decision, I think, what, four to three or Nishka, something? The Nishka, the Nishka. For the Nishka. The, the problem is, is McMillan should be quiet, the federal minister of environment. He doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. Crombie has made an offer. You, when you have a situation like this, you have to meet and you have to talk. There should be public outcry that Bennett is goofing off someplace in Halifax or something and refusing to meet with these people. You have to sit down and talk this thing out. It has to be talked out. The loggers don't want to fight with, with, with the natives or with anybody. The loggers, in this dangerous work, there, there's a lot of people hurt in the bush, falling trees like that can't be half thinking about falling this tree 
and half thinking about somebody throwing a bloody rock at him or something. And if he does get hurt, to go back to his truck and find the tires flat and his radio inoperative, it, it's insane. Somebody is going to get seriously hurt. And this provincial government and the leader of this government have to sit down and talk, get some meetings going. It has to happen. More with Jack Monroe after the break. So what's your position right now? The logging should continue on Lyle Island, the law should be obeyed, and Bennett should uh, sit down and negotiate. Jack, the logging has to continue. You, you can't build plants and, and plan your, your operations and then have somebody take the natural resource away from you. There is a bit of a recovery in North America, but it sure as hell is not in British Columbia. But look at all these logs that are up for sale right now in the papers every well, day. Well, I know, and the government hasn't got the gumption to stop those either. It, it's a disgrace. The other hand, you need the logging for your loggers. We need log, right. And if it snows this heavy in downtown Vancouver in November, Jack, if, if we get a bad winter, we're going to have all kinds of manufacturing plants down because we don't have enough logs to keep us going till spring. Meanwhile, the logs are exported. Meanwhile, the logs are being exported, and he just give them a three months extension. There were three log ships over at uh, Carriage in the other day. Uh, Jack, Jack, there's well over 100 ships gone out of out of this province this year, and uh, and it, it's nonsense. It, it it shouldn't happen. What has to happen, Jack? We we're going to continue to log, and it doesn't hurt. Reforestation on Lyle is within a year probably the best. In the province, it, it, it greens up fast. What do you say to these environmentalists who say, we must save all these trees, who will not accept the fact that there's 450 square miles available for a park still leaving TFL 24? Right. Jack, What do right. you say to them? Well, I say that they should find out what the hell they're talking about. There is far more land up there available and should be preserved for a park. There's all kinds of Burnaby Narrows and the hot springs and this and that and all. That should be preserved. Nobody argues that. Lyle Island is one small part of it, 66 square miles in total out of, out of 700 or something, whatever it is, uh, square miles. And, and, and we're doing a good job of logging. We're doing a good job of reforestation. The trees grow back. They, they green up quick. It, it looks good. And, well, and, and that's the economy, the basis of the economy. Can yeah. we afford to lose a single lo job, logging job or sawmill job in British Columbia this winter? No. We've down. lost too many, and there isn't somebody else's tree. The, the trees are all all allocated. Committee. Go ahead from Shemanis. Yeah, from Shemanis. I want to talk about the fishing you were talking about earlier. No, I'm not talking about the fishing this morning. I've got time to talk about the fishing this morning. Fishing. First year that there's been an opening for the seine boats off of Lyle Island was this year because our guys built fish hatcheries. Go they ahead. They built them and restocked Go the Go ahead, tree. please. Yes, uh, is that me right now? Yeah, make it quick. Sir, I wanted to know why can't we just settle the Indian land claim issues? This is the whole reason we're having the problem right now. Why not put it on a fast track through the courts, get it negotiated, get it settled, and that okay. way... The Premier has to sit down and meet with the people. You can't do anything unless the Premier and the federal government sit down. Our union has said right away when Crombie mentioned a meeting, we will agree. We want to sit down. Bennett now. has a point, though. Bennett is not going to sit down and give all of British Columbia back to the Indians. There are all kinds of claims for all, most of Vancouver Island, most of the Coast Forest District, and elsewhere. And even with the Nishka decision, Bennett's going to have to give some consideration to land claims. Jack, but I don't know what the native or what the hist the uh, Haida's position is, is on this. And we won't find out till we sit down. In the meantime, you're jeopardizing our people's safety. And it's insane. What, what uh, 58 people have been arrested so far? It is nonsense. No violence, so to speak of at all. Well, our guys are, are pretty cool. Go ahead from Sanspit. Yes, I would like, Mr. Worcester, good morning. Uh, there are a lot more jobs that are on the line now. And right. uh, my husband's job is terminated. What's his job? He's an operator, machine operator. Yeah. And Sanspit is going to be a ghost town. And we are caught <clears> three ways between the environmentalist, McEnroe, right. and this. Right that thing that's happening over in Lyle Island. Now, I, we own beach property, and I sit here and I hear the helicopters and watch the RCMP and the Haida's being arrested and bucks going down the drain. It costs $3,000 an hour to operate that giant Sikorsky helicopter 
It's costing the police at least ten to twenty thousand dollars a day to run the operation up there, to take them over to Sandspit or Skidigate and have them released and then start all over again the next day. That's right. And I have been down to the airport and watched all this, and I see there's going to be a lot of people on unemployment. We have to move out. We're losing a brand new truck and our yeah. property. Yeah. And I, I really am, you know. Did your man work for Ben? Does your husband work for Mac and Blow? Yes, he does. And they've got problems up. March 31st. His but, job is terminated. Oh, dear. The, the problem Thanks right, for calling, my dear. Yeah, this, this is terrible. And this is the people who produce the wealth for this province. And, and a good chunk of, of the export dollars. Far more than yeah. fishing and oil and everything else into Canada, out of the logging industry. One, one other thing, one quick point, Jack. I heard in Halifax the other day, and I would sure as hell like to find out if, if the Department of Indian Affairs, the federal department, didn't purchase the lumber that's built for these picket shacks on Lyle Island. You're saying the Indian Affairs Department paid for the lumber that's for the picket shacks on Lyle Island? That's what I heard. It's highly likely. It's possible. Ah, oh dear. The jobs are the things that matter. And Bennett's right. intransigence and unwillingness to apparently to do anything. Well, he's got all these other characters over there. Jack got Monroe, some meetings. regional president of the IWA. I'll be back after the break. Well, except for the heavy stuff on Lyle Island, it was at least a bright program this morning. Tomorrow I'm going to do James Dubrow, author of Mob Rule, Inside the Canadian Mafia. And we're going to meet Peter Pollan. Peter Pollan. He's a Conservative Party leader in British Columbia. Never heard of him. And a couple of other things too. Webster, I hope the weather clears up tomorrow, 9 a.m. precisely. Mm -hmm.